I think there's something about being on the edge of a continent and uh, experiencing the sound of the waves and the sunsets and the birds that, that fly along the shoreline. It really represents the intersection between the land and the sea and it, it's such a dynamic, uh, changing coastline. For me, anytime you have water and mountains together, that's, that's something I want to paint. I want to fill the whole canvas with the water and the mountains. The Santa Barbara Coast. Sanctuary. Playground. Resource. Inspiration. Our coast is many things to many people. But while most of us can't imagine life without the beach or ocean, few of us know the rich history of our coastal areas or how that history shaped the city we love today. Santa Barbara is one of the oldest continuously inhabited cities in all of the Americas. The Chumash people called this area home for thousands of years before the arrival of European settlers. And the primary reason the Chumash located here was the same reason many of us are here today, the ocean. Beginning about 3,000 years ago, we begin to see in the archaeological record uh, increasing sophistication in using the marine environment. We find uh, the first fish hooks begin to appear. We find uh, harpoon parts. And about somewhere between a half and two thirds of people who spoke Chumash languages uh, lived in towns that were directly adjacent to the ocean. And uh, the largest towns anywhere in coastal Southern California were here along the Santa Barbara Channel. A succession of settlers followed the Chumash to our coast, drawn by the same combination of temperate climate and abundant resources. But there was one resource that was in short supply in the area, lumber. In 1872, the demand for lumber would lead to the creation of something that would change the face of Santa Barbara forever, Stern's Wharf. Before that time, you know, Santa Barbara was by and large sort of cut off from the outside world. I mean, you did have the stagecoach, but there was no railroad yet. And oftentimes, high tides, storms, etc., would uh, either cut off access uh, through the passes or further down in the Rincon area, they couldn't get through if, if the tides or storms were, were bad enough. It, actually, the construction of the wharf, wharf I think you can fairly say, uh, jump-started the city as we know it. it. It became easier to unload lumber, which became easier to, to build homes, which be, became easier to build a real community. As Santa Barbara grew and development inched its way to the coast, a grassroots movement began to preserve this area for all to use. I think Santa Barbara has been uh, incredibly fortunate that we have had, uh, we've benefited from any number of public spirited citizens, sometimes just through uh, ground roots political organization, sometimes through uh, the giving of money to preserve uh, the coastline here in this area uh, for the public. If you take a historical bird's eye view of the Santa Barbara coastline, a pattern emerges of public spaces made possible either by philanthropy, citizen-led initiative, or a combination of both. In fact, that pattern starts at the very entrance to the city coming from the south at the Andre Clark Bird Refuge. The bird refuge was a salt pond. They actually had a racing track around it at one time. That racing track be, uh, went into disrepair. Interestingly, 60 individuals put in $100 each to purchase the old salt pond. And so really there the, the property sat in, until 1928 when uh, the Clark family stepped into the, uh, into the situation. So Anna and uh, her daughter, if you get, decided to uh, give $50,000 uh, to the city to develop um, the area into a true refuge, a true city park. And that pattern of philanthropic, citizen-led preservation of coastal land continued from there. From David Gray's construction and donation of the Cabrillo Pavilion to the citizen-led effort to preserve Shoreline Park. Shoreline Park had been threatened with apartment buildings a number of times. Uh, in the city, uh, working in combination with, with a, a local citizens group, Save Our Shoreline, 
put together a bond issue that essentially the city condemned and the bond issue paid for the improvements to what today is one of the most magnificent viewing areas along the western end of the city's waterfront area. More recently, the last stretch of undeveloped open space in the city was saved by a strong grassroots effort. Beautiful piece of property which had been a nursery it was called the Wilcox property. There was an opportunity that came forward that the developers who had purchased that property for a senior care facility actually entered into negotiations with members of the community about purchasing it for open space and merging it into the city's park system. A local effort to raise funds to do that took place and very frankly we got very, very close and it was the Douglas family, Michael Douglas specifically, who stepped forward in the name of his father who basically came up with the, the bridge funding in order to complete that sale. So today what you have is the Douglas Family Preserve being a beautiful natural area which is really, really popular. After a century of this private to public land transfer, about 60% of the more than six miles of Santa Barbara's coast is publicly held and all of it is accessible. But acquisition of this land is only part of the story. The city has also taken on the responsibility of protecting, enhancing, and enlivening this area as well. Well, we have a ton of recreational activities, starting with fishing. We have charter boats that uh, take folks half day and three quarter day fishing, but you can rent sailboats, uh, you can rent paddle, paddle boards, kayaks. This place in the summertime is a buzz with recreational activity. You know, there's a couple things we do. First of all, we maintain 4.3 miles of beach here. Uh, we provide a lifeguard service in the summertime. So our beaches are well maintained. We provide beach volleyball courts for people to drop in and use uh, at no cost. Just about every city summer camp uses the beach in some manner or form. And so we have beach volleyball clinics, our junior lifeguard program. Um, we have other camps that are for kids ages 6 to 10, where they just get a bigger appreciation of the ocean, the beach environment, and how to you know, be good stewards of that moving forward. And when it comes to being good stewards of the coastline, the city has led by example. A successful ballot measure in 2000 resulted in the creation of the Creek's Restoration and Water Quality Improvement Program, the first of its kind in the state. Since that time, the Creek's Division has done a number of projects, including a, a major restoration effort down at Arroyo Borough uh, Estuary and Henry's Beach. And we do continuous operations along the beach. We do beach cleaning three times a week. We work with California Coastal Commission on Coastal Cleanup Day. We work with a number of nonprofit organizations throughout the city to do beach cleanups on a monthly basis. We have a tremendous amount of volunteers come out and participate in our Creek Week events. Other communities have stormwater programs that work to improve water quality, but nothing that is so involved with protecting the natural environment as what we have with the Creeks Division in the city of Santa Barbara. The natural environment of Santa Barbara's coast is also unique, boasting a variety of ecosystems. Santa Barbara's coastline is, is very diverse. We have bluff tops in the Mesa area of Santa Barbara. We've got coastal estuaries from Arroyo Borough to Mission down to Sycamore. We have a brackish wetland in the Andre Clark Bird Refuge. The Santa Barbara area is very unique for marine species because we sit right at a transition zone. And so Point Conception is where everything changes. So basically what happens is you have this California current, which is a cold water coming down from the north. And then here we have this nice warm water in Southern California and they meet here in the Santa Barbara Channel. And so we have this great transition zone. So you get amazing biodiversity. So we have the whales that are migrating by. We have fishes that mate on land. We have many, many bird species. Uh, marine mammal species, so it's, it's just a fantastic area of biodiversity. That fantastic biodiversity supports a variety of commercial fishing operations. We have a lot of different fisheries here. Sea urchins is huge. I believe we're the, the number one sea urchin uh, port in the country. We also have lobsters and crab, white sea bass and yellowtail and sharks and, and swordfish, a whole range of fisheries that add up to about 10 or 11 million pounds a year. It's a thriving business. But the coastal environment is a dynamic one and always changing. 
one of the great questions outstanding is just how fast it's changing, especially in regards to sea level rise. We have very narrow beaches here, as you can see, and we have a receding coastline. And so we're going to see a lot more of things like this, a lot more um, flooding. And ev everything you see during a big storm event and dramatic events like this will be happening more frequently. Scientists know this because while this year's El Nino hasn't delivered the rain expected, it has provided something else of value, data. What we're doing along the beaches and coastline of Santa Barbara is making high resolution scans with our equipment to measure the coastal change um, throughout El Nino. And during El Nino we have sea levels that have been raised about 20 to 30 centimeters. This is the projected sea level rise for the end of the 21st century. So this year is a very good kind of um, you know, window into what we might be seeing more of. And so in a lot of places where we have cliffs um, and where we have uh, just infrastructure that's right up to the edge, you know, we do not have the opportunity for those beach ecosystems to move inland. And so they're stuck. And with that rise in sea level, as well as the potential for additional coastal storms, we may be looking at and need to look at ways to further protect our infrastructure and identify new ways of managing the ecological areas of our coast as well. Whatever challenges lay ahead for our coastal areas, one thing is for sure, Santa Barbara will meet them. We have relied upon this unique intersection of land and sea for sustenance, solace, and amusement for thousands of years. We are a community that has time and again come together to say we value this magical place and want to preserve it for all to enjoy. What they started back in the 1920s, we're now a century from that particular and we're enjoying the benefits of that. Science can help predict uh, changes and things that are going to happen to our coastline, but which solutions that we choose really reflect our values. Local knowledge, and values clarification can really help us work towards protecting the coastline and keeping it in its natural state. There is so much history here. There's so much to see and do right here, right now that you w wouldn't want to miss it and you might want to spend a considerable amount of time in this area itself.